Hello, uh, we're here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm where over here and y'all are over there. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I, I shouldn't open with a Chris Chen reference. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's terrible. You've, but yes, you've uh, already given an incredibly cursed energy already. I, I have, I have given it a very cursed energy. But um, I'll tell the uh, the people to refresh, because sometimes they need to refresh. But yes, hello and welcome to our Monday stream. Welcome to Technically Evelyn's show, as yes. we're calling it. <laughs> Since it is technically your show. I, I have organised all of these, at least, and generally tend to do all the... Uh stream stuff for them so i do at least have some responsibility and it was also <laughs> me that uh has allowed to rope in this evening one of my favorite frog friends uh mr <laughs> panama hat yes welcome yes uh thank you very much for having me on and good evening everybody friend time <laughs> um i'll Keep do the friend. normal the normal youtube -y stuff uh, if you want to ask some questions, the best way to do that is through uh, our donations. We will read the chat when we're not uh, complete uh, check or snorkelers. But, uh, <laughs> but if you want to donate to us, the Streamlabs links are the best way to do it. That is the pinned comment and also in the description. We are still monetized on YouTube by some miracle of nature. So you can become a member if you want to support us month to month. Or you can send a super chat if you don't mind uh, YouTube taking like a 30% cut, which they do. Uh, apart from that, we do have the links down below. I don't know, Evelyn, if you've put Mr. Panama Hat's links have, in the description or not. Actually, uh, I ah, watched yes. his uh, video on Yukio Mishima earlier on and rather enjoyed it, to be honest. Very good. Uh, thank you. Yes. Is this oh, someone no, I should... Yeah. I get, oh, was this a phrase I, I, I use so many times now, but it's someone I should probably know more about than I actually do. Mm. Uh, someone I think the comments was recommending uh, was it Mishima: A Life in Four Chapters or something? Oh, it's it's a wonderful film. Yeah, that's that's one of my one of my absolute favorites. Uh, lots of the clips in the video were. Oh, oh hello. Yep, still here. Oh, we're still going. Um, yeah, lo lots of the clips in the video were from that film. Uh -huh. Um, very and and it's it's sort of uh, it it's not like a, it's, I wouldn't call it an art film, but it's sort of uh, it's it it portrays um various scenes from his life but also from his novels mm. um uh because you know sort of uh he drew a lot on, on his own kind of psychology uh to write those novels which are very i mean even if uh i'd say i'd recommend it to people even if you're not a fan of sort of uh novels as such just the, the prose itself is so beautiful to read even if you don't really care about the story as such um it's just you know very very finely crafted pieces of artwork uh those books he was also a, a, an early uh, buy into uh, Homo Fash. Yeah, yeah, very much Homo Fash. Uh, he had a private army of right wing uh, students <coughs> um, with whom he attempted to stage a coup uh, towards the end of his life, immediately before, it, in fact. Is this like uh, Nick Fuentes' Catboy Army? No. <laughs> this is. <laughs> There's a lot. This is, this is this is leagues above the Nick Fuentes Catboy Army. I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, but yes, Mishima is pretty wild. Although I will admit to not having read anything of his in its entirety. I've mostly been fed excerpts by certain people. I will. But um, I will. I will shill as a starter sort of aperitif for Mishima. Um, if you find a Substack called uh, Barbarization a la Japonaise. Um, which is a uh, a substack of somebody who translates Mishima's. Uh, he he wrote he wrote sort of short stories and essays all the time that have not been translated, and this guy is translating them for free on Substack. And he translated recently a brilliant essay called "Discourse on Misogyny," um, where Mishima <laughs> basically just like like he 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 just he just very very elegantly in his own language tells women to eat shit. <laughs> uh it's a, it's is he a, it's doing a, the woman question he yeah. is he he deals with the woman question he he says that he wants to take all female members of the japanese parliament and throw them into tokyo bay uh he's, know, yeah. he's very schopenhauer pilled he is he is also this, this, despite being a raging homosexual he had a, an arranged marriage to with a, a wife and he had two children um who are still around now as far as i'm aware uh, and they they actually will sue you if you say that Mishima was a homosexual in Japan. 
<laughs> really? Yeah, they will. The, that that film I was talking about, um, he's it's it's never been released in in Japan because it has scenes which depict his uh, frequenting of gay uh, uh, nightclubs and such. Um, is that just a verboten topic then? Have they formed some sort of like litigious company? Have they got the uh, the mission yeah. of Zaibatsu? They've they've got the kind of Mishima is is the the estate, if you will. Despite the fact that everybody knows, like he was an open <laughs> homosexual, pretty much. He himself would write about it. You know, they if you mention he was a homosexual, they will sue you. So he's like reverse George Michael. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good way to describe him. But yeah. Well, that's enough preamble, I think. Shall we? Shall we get into the the actual topic today? Because I know I know people may have some slightly different ideas of what we're doing than what we're actually doing. Yes. Um, the tagline I put was, "We're taking a break from owning the libs to define the libs," but there's <laughs> there's a huge amount, huge amount of talk about liberalism, and and how bad liberalism and, and liberalism bashing, but there isn't really a lot of definition, I think, from this corner of the internet. Solid definition about what liberalism actually is, especially when it comes down to the fundamentals of it. Yeah. I think as well that there is no there is no real appreciation for how much of a big part it played in a number of the aspects of the things we look back on history to you know the the part it played in creating those things and providing the conditions for those things. Hmm. It's it's a useful one, and it's as as the first thing I think you put in the document here. I think liberalism was really defined post hoc. Um, yes. The joke I made off air is that people think of liberalism like they think of capitalism. They think liberalism came fully formed from the mouth of mm -hmm. uh, of Locke, you know, from people who've read Loki. Um, just like they think that capitalism and the market was invented by Adam Smith. It's kind of like how people talk about Sir Isaac Newton inventing gravity. Mm. Is that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, it's essentially Hopper and the... Uh, I can't remember the name of it now because I did two bloody videos on it. Uh, the, the quest, or the grand quest for libertarian narrative history or whatever. He sort of stipulates that one could really look at the entire period from about 500 AD to about 1500 AD as the, the actual period of liberalism as it existed in the world. You know, and, and he uses the phrase at the time, you know, he discusses the, the handwork of some sort of thing and the mund work. And that that was the, the world within which the, the handwork of liberalism existed, the, the physical action that created a liberal world, world order in the way that people who, you know, look back on scholasticism as the tradition that Hoppe is ultimately drawing on. I mean, that, that, that whole period he's discussing there is this sort of period of, I think, what you could fairly refer to as Latin Christendom. I can hear Sargon reeing from here already about the fact that we're, we're we're sort of already steering down the line of looking at liberalism never through or not sorry but not through the typical protestant universalist lens where you just debunk it and smash it to bits but the more subtle and kind of nuanced catholic scholastic version of liberalism which again i think there's something that so much can be learned from and appreciated of and you know, I'm someone that I should probably spend a lot more time reading Aquinas than I really have, because I think yes. I I forget how much that people like Rothbard and Mises are still really, as much as they are writing in a modern context, are still deriving stuff that goes right back to someone like Aquinas. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could you could make the case that I mean he like, especially in the modern world. Um, I mean, if you go and study philosophy at a modern university, I mean, you'll learn, like, you won't learn Aquinas at all. As far as they're concerned, philosophy started with um, um, Descartes um, in the mm. 1600s, uh, which, is, which, is very, which is absolutely criminal uh, idea, because that, that, that's why everybody that comes out of university of um, philosophy departments is so pause um, in one way or another, e even if they're technically right wing. Because they have no education in in anything that came before the modern era, you know, yeah. they have no kind of uh, they have no kind of true metaphysics, if you will. Um, well, see, that was I mean, and as you say, Aquinas is you know the, very much a powerhouse of the obviously the the, the 
Christian side of philosophy, but also just more based, if you want to call it that, strands of philosophy in general. He was also very, very influential on the foundational elements of the British university system when it yeah. comes to like scholarly, when actually being a scholar in Britain meant following a, uh, a Thomistic tradition. And that's mm. really how it all got started. That's where a lot of the kind of prestige of the British education system came from, was that it followed this, you know, Thomistic uh, scholastic tradition. And it was hugely influential over here. And that's what really gave birth uh, when we talk about, quote, unquote, the Enlightenment and all that in Britain. We, it really gave birth to the, the period of, you know, the late 17th, early 18th century in which these things are, are being described. Uh, you, you can't have one without the other. I mean, I, I touched, not to again shill myself, but I touched on that very heavily in the speech that I did at the Shieldings event. I talked about the fact that you you can't see history, you can't see liberalism, you can't see you know things like Hopper's paleo-libertarianism without having that through line right back into uh, into really kind of the myths the myths of Albion really when you look at the British tradition mm -hmm. yeah and well, you you have this contiguous line of thought from antiquity filtered especially through Aquinas picking that up picking up the uh, the class you know european tradition and then that being passed on to what we you know what modern people would see as the the liberals in the in the 18th century yeah well no i was, I was going to say that you can you can basically sniff out very quickly the people who have made it to a reactionary position and have read scholastic materials before they got there and then got the, or the people who ended up in the reactionary position and didn't read mm -hmm. that stuff first because they yeah. they are so much more I feel likely to just adapt themselves to as you, as you pointed out a lot more modern and modernist sort of text I mean the the people who have a massive focus on like all the different German idealists strikes me as you know it's you you basically try to read everything that isn't liberal theory because they have some preconceived notion about it that it only exists yeah. after Locke or it only exists after Adam Smith mm -hmm. that, that that whole big period of history where lots and lots of great things happened and there was a world which we could look back upon and actually draw things out of you know that that was liberalism the, as I'm saying the, the point from Hopper that was the the handwork of it the building of it it didn't require to be ideologically you know presupposed upon people for the system to work they just lived mm. in what they knew in some basic form as God's law or natural law, and that was that was kind of all that was needed. It was sort of common sense, I'll, but in a much more transcendent form. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'll, I'll I'll interrupt this. We do actually have a a two pound super chat there from uh, from D's bit of rough. <laughs> He says Yukio is based on women, but he's not Mr. D, and there may or may not be an uwu there to completely bring the tone of the stream down. Extremely ribald. <laughs> well, actually, it, it's funny. It's funny that you should uh, mention that because I uh, tried to make the argument to Mr. D the other morning that he is just the British Mishima. Uh, yeah, he kind of is. I mean, if you think about it, he hates women. He's an artist. He has a preference for men. And uh, he has an army of like right wing young simps that will like pop, that will fall well, into the grave, I presume. I in mean, certain he's ways, he's, he's possibly even slightly better. He is Yukio Mishima with the body of Yukio Mishima wish he had. <laughs> well, I mean, Mishima was Mishima was pretty ripped uh, by his midlife. He, was, he, was he not he quite trained. short? Though? Was that not part of the whole thing? Um, I don't know at all. I mean, he was Japanese, so I'm going to assume yeah. he, yeah, he. I mean, given that Mr. D is an absolute giant. Uh, I I doubt you, Mishima was that tall, but again, it's relative, isn't it? Um, in in Japan, maybe he was considered a uh, tall boy. I don't know. I think if you asked him if he wanted to be six foot six, he'd probably say fuck yeah in Japanese or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so J Japanese men of that era were generally of a shorter stature, though, simply because of the the diet that they had. Yeah, but, uh... living up in the interwar period, I'm sure that was uh, homely. Mm, yes. <laughs> Uh, the uh, well, the ideas of liberalism as an older tradition, you're right, I think would cause a lot of people to re... Um, if you look in the modern sense, when you look at how liberalism... I know you, you just spoke about the way people come out of university when they study uh, philosophy, but if they study politics, 
they will see liberalism as a product of someone like Mills. They'll be taught essentially Benthamite utilitarianism mm -hmm. as liberalism. I mean, um, I would, I would take. I mean, again, and the the kind of issue that sits above that is that they see it as basically the only acceptable system. That they're not, they're not really ever given. Um, that it, there's always this kind of subversive idea in the way we teach political um, science in the West, which is that basically you have liberalism, which is what, which is the only good system, basically, kind of liberal. Uh, parliamentarianism and then you have all these other ones which are kind of you know fit, you know sort of failed um but we have to learn about them because they happened you know um uh, that's the impression i get anyway that that's that's the that's what's that's the process in most people's minds sorry i just I'm... that's some very very aggressive typing there firing a machine gun into the wall there yeah. <laughs> everyone blizz Everyone has not got used to the mechanical keyboard yet with the uh, with the light touch red switches and just wow. attacks it. Um, I'll put it in stream resources, but a lot of people's versions of history is this this atheist meme. This I think this is one of the worst things to happen to like education or like just people's minds in general is that this is how people actually like this is what atheists actually believe. Should they be actually like, flash. Do. Yeah. Should be flashing up on screen now. They believe that really the height of medieval Europe, the the period of you know up until about the 1500s, when what they were doing was essentially creating, um, by the day's standards, like almost like a miracle post scarcity society yeah. through the division of labor. Um, yeah, this through is, the. This is one of the most like shockingly disingenuous, inaccurate and disgusting like things i've ever seen put i mean I've, I've i've seen this around uh for a few years now um and i mean i mean it, it doesn't even really make historical sense because it, it assumes that scientific advancement is linear which it you oh, know like yeah. that that's it's you you're, you're assuming that that technologies are not like varying all over the place anyway um all the all the the the, the, the idea that it's like an advanced this 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 assumed idea that it's just all progress that technology is progress how how you can i mean i personally don't see the industrial age as being a as being progress i just see it as being the this sort of the subservience of man to machine mm, it's, um, it's replication not innovation in a certain it's, sense ex exactly exactly i do um, like the then... fact that the the the, 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 the as you say the, the common narrative is like this bit to this bit the whole gray christian dark age is ooh, it's it's the ooh. worst period in Boo! Uh, the worst period in history, and Hopper's just like, yeah, this bit was meant. We should be like this. But it, it, it like, anybody who would look at this and go and agree with it clearly just doesn't know anything about mm. uh, about the, what the Christian dark, the quote dark ages were like, um, or anything in general. I mean, also, I imagine that the person that put this together was probably a leftist, and it's a uh, very uh very eurocentric uh yes <laughs> uh, yes it is it? you know it, it, it doesn't take into account any of the discoveries being made in asia or the middle east i mean obviously it, it mentions egypt but it's doing that as a as a part of uh western so the the big thing here is that it it's very it, it is really kind of like the wig view of history writ large mm. it's it, like this this is the way that most people view history and that's kind of the problem again when we're talking about a liberal tradition that is older than the quote unquote enlightenment um you you have an uphill battle with people you have an uphill battle with their own definitions i think this is sometimes why this discussion goes nowhere even in you know explicitly right-wing circles because i mean the elephant in the room is that the americans have the worst idea of what liberalism is yes uh, because they they use the word differently um, I, think, I think we can just shorten that to the americans have the worst ideas yes <laughs> yeah. oh the americans are the worst sorry mm. sorry radlib yeah. and fellow americans but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean everyone's the worst on average it just means that the uh, not all yeah the extremities at either end are a bit far out from my liking i mean i i did i did recently write a like a seven thousand word article called "The American Disease," um, but 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 I, that's kind of part of it in that they they have a an idea of what is quote unquote liberal that is a very born yesterday idea, 
Mm-hmm. It is, it's not really... Oh, there's there's Radlib. Mm. Uh, is that is that Radlib? It is Radlib. Yes, yeah, that's Radlib. Hello, Radlib. Uh, thank you, there, Mister. I'll, re- I'll read that in a second. But they have an idea of liberalism that is is compounded and molded by the fact that they have a country that is only two hundred and fifty years old, really. Um, <laughs> and they, as as much as we struggle here in Britain to view things kind of uh, pre kind of Tudor as as not the dark ages in quotes they have a very very hard time of viewing anything that is pre-american civil war really yeah. as not the dark ages they they have like a twin birth of their ideas that is 1776 and the 18 the 1870s mm-hmm. um you know the reconstruction era and the uh you know the, Re- the revolutionary war and that's really where their mindset lays and i think that's that's part of what you see here is that because they have to live almost in like the constant now in terms of ideas. There's almost like a tubular rasa thing with American philosophy that they have to, you know, they have to buy into this like turbo Reddit version of the Whig view of history because they, mm-hmm. to believe anything else is to, is to realize that essentially they live in like an infant country without, without a culture. <laughs> well, no, they, they, they have all the, the trappings of liberalism, shall we say, without the most important part, which is some form of representation of the, the literal God King. I mean, I think it's, I would say it's unfair really to discuss liberalism without thinking about the, the fact that it was a set of ideas that was concurrent with monarchy, not with parliamentary democracy or social democracy as it really is now in that sort of sense. Mm. That you know, to even hint at universal suffrage and the mass managerial state is anything approaching, you know, the, the, even the absolute monarchies of the 14th, 15th, 16th century, whatever, is just completely out of the line to me, really. And yet, that seems to be people are pretty happy to make that assertion day in, day out <laughs> that these two, these two things are interchangeable somehow. I will read uh, Radlib's super chat there. Thank you for the five dollars, Mr. Radical Liberation. Uh, good recommendation. He said I would recommend How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization by Tom Woods, um, as a as a curative for this kind of ignorance of the Middle Ages. I think I have a PDF somewhere, and I think I might have actually nicked a bit of that at one point. Uh, but I've not read again. It's one of those things I've magpied bits from and not read in its entirety. So I should probably fix that. Um, yeah, but. Uh, Tom Woods, uh, how the Catholic Church built Western civilization, is a very good recommendation there. Thank you for that. It's very relevant. Mm-hmm. Clink. Yeah, so, uh, sorry about that. I to, it's, I'm going to go and turn that off. It's a, it's a heater I've got on. Uh, oh, no, I, I, it's, it's fine. It's, it's not too bad. Uh, no, it's, it's just it's, a... it's, it's, it's starting to annoy me. I'm going <laughs> to deal with it. <laughs> Some slight dead air there, but Evelyn, help move the stream on. Give us well, the no, I just think that you know you can't talk about liberalism as any form of serious set of ideas without discussing the implications of both Christian and sometimes more specifically Catholic metaphysics and the the fact that it's it's centered around some form of monarchy, not a pure parliamentary democracy. Well, it's you've put it. It's centered in two things. It's centered in sovereignty of a divine or divinely chosen being in many ways mm. and when you look at liberalism it's it's predicated largely you know i know Locke tried to have it both ways yeah but it's predicated largely on the idea of natural law and divine sovereignty and the idea of a natural state of things as a as a higher authority in of itself or as completely attached to a literal god and then add to that, you have liberal theory being focused on the decentralized interpersonal organization of people and the idea that, you know, that people exist apart from the state, as it were. Mm. People exist apart from the government. And I think that is a it's almost a reactionary idea when Locke talks about it, because he is reaching back when you talk about the homesteading principle and original appropriation, he's reaching back really to the civilizational times of, of Europe. Because even in those days in Europe, there wasn't much land going unused because you had to feed people. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the land going unused was unusable. So what he's doing is he's talking about, the, it's almost Locke being reactionary 
when he talks about things like original appropriation because he's reaching back to a time before the king mm. and he's really reaching back to the days of you know natural patriarchs and aristocracy uh that's where his ideas are uh, are centered and it's 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 those two things together i think that give us the power there because that's it's a lot of what Locke talks so a lot of what hopper talks about is is very much based in the I- idea of of the organizational world of an aristocracy coming out of the natural extended family of the patriarch and that is an idea that's antithetical you know is it completely incompatible with quote unquote modern liberalism well yeah i think the you can look at it in another sense through the point we might look at later from Alul, whereby society in that period was developed enough that there was techniques to do things within society, but there were no techniques explicitly stipulated for the organisation of society. And that maybe liberalism, in in a certain sort of sense, best understood is that period of time within which you have organised society, but not an organised society. Yeah. If that makes any sense, whereby it's... There is no, there really is no central body of it, and I mean that in the sense of, not that there wasn't authorities that were central to some component of land or people, but there was no central body of knowledge about how to organise the whole thing consciously as an entity, which is, yeah. you know, the, the the point in Gottfried, the point in Burnham, the point in Francis, and many other people, is that when that's that's your possibly your tipping point whereby liberalism really is no longer possible because it could never live up to the constraints and the conditions imposed upon the, the sort of technical necessity of organising a mass society. I mean, that's that's why I, I stipulated in my Nomos speech about Lenin being one of the key instigators of social democracy and in a certain sense he was really one of the first people to pioneer the techniques of operating an entire state as a, a, a political entity all in one goal. Mm-hmm. What, are you, what, what are your thoughts, Mr. Hatt? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm thinking about the points about it being kind of um, organized without being organized, you know, in that sense. Um, I mean, the, the big... <laughs> what really begins to look ominous about kind of Lockean philosophy, at least, is that you get this idea, well, I guess, I mean, this kind of predates Locke, I suppose, as more of a Hobbesian idea, but this this whole thing that, you know, everybody is a citizen of the state, um, I think is a, is a, it's, it's a far larger assumption than we today give that credit for. Mm. Um, because you would, that would not have been considered really to be a true idea um, prior to that, because you weren't really a citizen of the state as such. You were, you were a subject of the monarch, but even then, you were you had kind of other obligations. Of course, you were a you were a servant of God. You know, you were a you you had you had loyalty to a liege or a vassal or a lord. Um, you had you had you may have had your own sort of fiefdom that you had to look after, even if that was just a household with a few servants and your own family. You know, the I think that the the issue with liberalism is again it 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 kind of assumes all power to the state. Um, in a in a in a subtle way, even if it doesn't seem like that, you know. Um, well, it's it's more like you you start with a process of <clears throat> ever greater organization, mm. and that just you know that alone, without any moral or or political apprehensions, inevitably starts the process of someday at some point realizing well it can be argued that we should all just put it in, you know, authority should be bestowed all upon one place. And I know that's where you kind of end up with, you know, the, the writers are attributed to the to the theory of absolutist monarchy, because to some extent that's where they get from. But mm-hmm. the thing I always found sort of interesting from someone like Filmer is that he is annoyed with them because they get there via the position of popular consent. And I think that starting to look at it in the way that he's looking at things, where he is so innately tied to this idea that the world is always just ruled by absolute monarchy in some sense. It's just whether or not about how honest you really are with the populace about how you function it. Mm -hmm. 
and it, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a sort of bizarre contrast really that it's such an old world idea, but it gets us to such a, a prescient new world conclusion about ultimately elite theory. Yes. Um, and I, I think that you, you kind of hinted at it there, but it is in a sense, it's a, it's a system which I think is based on a large amount of demonstrably false lies um, or kind of illusions or sort of smoke and mirrors about the nature of things. Um, I mean, I think this is especially true if you look at societies, well, perhaps, I mean, really the only society, I suppose, that was founded explicitly on kind of uh, Lockean, I suppose, um, radical principles um, around the time that they had been developed or not long after, which was, of course, the 13 colonies in America when they, when they became the United States. Um, I mean, basically, despite all the theorizing and the kind of the, the disagreements between the kind of Hamiltonian versus the Jeffersonian, etc., the issue you have is that you know, there's you can you can you can give a society to liberalism all you want, but there's a, there's only one set of laws, and those are the law, those are the natural laws of God. That's the natural hierarchy, and the kind of um, the there's a certain falsity that that uh, we have about the way early liberalism worked and the way America worked, especially this idea that it was, you know, there's, we, we have this assumption that it was a successful experiment. I mean, I don't mm. think it was. I, th I, th I think it had failed the minute it started. Um, you know, the, I, I, you know, I mean, we, we talk about how elections tended to be, tend, uh, of course, the most recent election was, was rigged. But I mean, elections were being rigged um all in all sorts of ways from sort of like the, the foundation of the states all the way up to sort of like 1930 you know <laughs> the, the, <laughs> very, myth of the, the myth regularly. of the free and fair election yes. exactly the myth of the election the, the fact that it was always a machine polity mm. you know two parties the fact that um you know uh there was always a kind of pull towards the central state no matter how much they talked about the decentralization um of of the states because i mean of course to me decentralization is perhaps the most important aspect of a state i could admire or a society i could admire i mean yes. but the example i use is not like something like the united states because they have this contradiction where they want decentralization but they also want kind of uh liberalism and kind of universalism and i don't think i don't think the two gel and you will always get that pull towards towards the central state um we, that, that we have had another super chat though I'll, I'll read it before it gets a bit too old <laughs> it has been there for a little bit uh, mr glow in the dark donated ten dollars and said christian dark age was more about the collapse of a major power and its consequences example brundish collapse uh guess the christians had to preserve and make a foundation so other people could advance I, I partially, I think that a lot of that though is to do with the extremely Rome-centric version mm. of history people push, yeah. and there's there's this uh, e extreme Romophile stuff that goes mm. on, and the quote-unquote collapse of Rome as a as a contiguous being is seen as the the greatest uh, disaster to ever befall the world ever, am, when really uh, it was kind of a slow transition to a different phase. But I am I am I am slightly worried that people have have, have come on the stream and they they think that they think that we are uh, saying this graph is correct. Uh, no, no, no. I just no. want to stress we aren't doing this. Is this is, <laughs> this yes. is why uh, Evelyn? I've I've I put I've got a better image so we can get that terrible graph off the screen. All right, fair enough. That'll do. Um, that is a good yeah, just, to, just, just to wrap up that point, the kind of decentralization I look to is the early Christian style European society. I think it was almost perfect in the way that you had all these kind of local entities and local entities within local entities, um, all technically loyal to, say, the Holy Roman Emperor or to a faraway monarch or to the Pope. Um, but realistically they were essentially independent and they remained loyal through immaterial means you know they remained loyal because it was it was honorable they were they were duty bound to give their due to the emperor even if they didn't even know you know that, where where the emperor was or what he was doing you know that level of deception you're talking about though in early american sort of founding i think much of that is just a product of loyalty being bestowed and the people quote unquote and that because it wasn't bestowed in God, or it wasn't bestowed in the king, then there was no, there was actually no measure for account. The only measure mm. for account was the, when, the when some, state. 
yeah, you know, when some other part of the body politic acting as uh, acting as the people in an accordance decided to get rid of you as a some sort of part of a minority that they mm. didn't want ruling anymore. And I think yeah. you, you can see that a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I think really caused a lot of failures and some of the foundation of America and everything around it, despite yeah. the issue of not having a monarchy, is just the fact that they were they were all sort of ever so slightly power hungry, and as much as they wanted to be good loyal men in the eyes of God and the American people and whatever else, they did all just come at each other's throats politically for decade well, they, after they, decade they, after decade, they, as you do in yeah. re, you know Republican political but situations. The, <laughs> the, the issue with a, with a kind of system like America's and the system that they've kind of spread across the world is that. You with these kind of uh, utilitarian liberal ideas, you have to pretend that people are fundamentally good, and that government is a kind of uh, tame, benevolent idea. The, the reality is, it, it isn't, and it never will be. Um, this is why I'm such a fan of uh, mafia and uh, gangster-related re media, because because a <laughs> because a lot of the time, a lot of the time, the the the, the good examples of that genre. They're not really about the mafia. They're kind of um, Shakespearean or perhaps Greek tragedian <laughs> uh, lessons about feudalism and power. Because the because essentially, I mean, this this may sound like I'm criticizing it through this, but I but I mean, this is just because it obeys the laws of power. Feudal monarchy is pretty much just the mafia, or the mafia is a smaller scale form of of feudal monarchy. In my opinion, mm. I mean. You, this is, this is, this is, I mean, this is the reality about how power is shared, you know, and how power works. You have powerful men and their families and their associates and the agreements they make with each other. I mean, and this is the same in America. This is the same in a society that pretends it's ultra liberal and revolutionary. You know, this is, this is just what power is between humans. I mean, it, it's, it, it can't be any other way. And, you know, this is why in America, you've never really had what you could call genuine democracy because the elites, because you can't have that. You can't have a system that unstable because you, you, you need power. You know, you, if you're, if you're, um, if, if, if you're a political family, if you're the, if you're, if you're the, the, the Adams or the Tafts or the Roosevelt's or the Bushes or the Clintons, you can't trust a system that may actually just like, you know, vote you and your entire clique out of power somehow. Mm. And you, you've, You've got to be entrenched in some way because otherwise you can't rule, you know. And of course, we can we can make particular bad examples of those names, but all political power, in my opinion, is passed through families. It's passed because a human lifespan and the time you spend in office is simply not enough to do anything of note. I don't think. I mean, well, that's that's it, how it, it works as a function of gatekeeping, not even by you know, physically excluding people. You just exclude people by the nature of the fact that you might you might be able to accrue some sort of power by being a member of parliament. But as you say, mm. you will not be part of the inner clique. You yeah. know, you will not have the you know, the, the legacy institutions where not necessarily the real power originates, but if you want to execute the... any real power within society, you will need those legacy institutions and their backing. And if you don't have that because you're not in, then it's you're not going anywhere. Ergo... I can feel a uh, a Tony Soprano stream coming in our future at some point, though. Oh, I love, that. I love that. I think honestly, analysis of Tony Soprano is like the last patriarch, is like the, the last the natural, the last feudalist. Yeah, the last natural elite. Yeah, the last natural elite. Yes. Um, is he's um... a great great example of the idea of you know, where the vacuum is and, you know, where where essentially the state can't provide that people have to step up. It, it, and... it would be perfect because I recently I recently rewatched re that show. So uh, I, yeah, I'm we... ready. Yeah. We didn't get to, right to the end, but yeah, me, Evelyn and Jess did watch it for the for the first time, really, only a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was it was wonderful. It was as as, as good as people said it was and better in places. There's mm -hmm. there's definitely some bits in like season three and four where it reaches a peak of of not only just the uh, the content and the dialogue and the way it's written, but it's a very stylish show. I'd recommend it. But yeah, he it's a great it's he's a great character study of like the the last patriarch really. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yeah, the Aurelian Natius Caesar in chat. If Rome, or then well, super chat, sorry. If Rome wasn't the centre of the West, why do all the roads lead to Rome? Checkmate, atheist. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. I hated the North. I, a lot of people are not so happy for Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, um, I mean, the whole thing about um, the sort of Roman collapse and the idea of it being, you know, the worst thing that ever happened. I mean, as, as you say, it didn't really collapse so much as it just kind of dissolved. Um, and in many, I mean, I mean, to be honest, pretty much all over Western Europe, the Roman power structures and the, the what was the Roman Empire on a day to day level survived. Some some of it survived. I mean, some of it's still technically there now. I mean, it's it's some of it just never went away. You know, you you just you kept going and it just became kind of Christianized. That was it. That was, you know, the, the we, we we think of the collapse of Rome as this great dramatic cataclysm. But I think for most people, they just continued living. You know, they just they just kept kept going. And in a lot of places, authority remained stable. Um, it, 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 there wasn't, you know, we think of it as this, you know, the barbarian horde descending upon Europe, but, you know, sort of a slightly disingenuous uh, view of what happened uh, in, in a lot of places. Um, so, yeah, this whole idea of the Christian Dark Age is, you know, I think we've already uh, sort of we, thrown we've that out. Thoroughly beaten that horde. Yeah. <laughs> it is dead and it is it has been beaten thoroughly. Um, shall we move on to your next point there? I see in the notes, which is a very prescient point, which is the idea of the law. But we're going to get very, uh, maybe slightly bastiat held here. But there's, there's an idea of previous to the modern age, and really the, the liberalism, especially the liberal democracy, is a 20th century idea. It's a 20th century affectation when we think about you know, the sacredness in the abstract of the state's law rather than the idea of, you know, natural law or the traditions or you know the law is something static the law is something ever changing ever evolving and constantly being redefined is a very very modern idea um and the the canon of state law versus you know god's law or natural law is a, is a very important part of with the bastardization of liberalism because liberalism even you know even the lockean sense is very much not based around that is the fact that it's explicitly antithetical to that um if you look at again to talk about bastiat his whole thing is like if we have just laws if we have a just system if we have uh just judgments and all the people agree that they are just why do we need to keep changing them why does there mm. need to be this constant cycle of new officials and new bureaucrats adding to it and bastardizing it? So if, if we reached a point where the law was just, the law would become static and should yeah. become static. Yes, um, and, um, there, are, there are many examples of societies with static laws prior to the liberal age that just, you know, they, there really isn't a need to um, alter them. I mean, uh, obviously, Christian societies have many examples of this. Another, an example that was slightly longer lasting is that a lot of uh, is Islamic societies in the Middle East and Asian societies, um, they had these just static codes of laws that were set down like 400 years ago, and then they they practically never ever knew what is just. I mean, once, once, at, you have a, once you have a just law, you have a just law. As you look at the case of like even Japan or China up until their modernization, you know, the, the, who knows how many thousands of years that continued on for. I think exactly. on, the, on the subject of China, I might as well segue into some of the uh, literature, shall we say, that we've got for this evening. Uh, I've got I've managed to steal a bit of poetry from a uh, Kuhn out Leiden that you might enjoy. <laughs> uh, oh, Mr. Mr. Leiden himself. Yes. yes yeah, I see in the page. chat there, Radley, we do bring up Bastiat semi-regularly. He's, he's quite heavily quoted in our democratization series, actually. There's a whole section about the foundational nature of, of Bastiat. And his contemporaries, this... and basically, it's basically us doing the whole uh, the French Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. Um... The state is the great fiction by uh, which one man lives at the expense of another, and so on and yes. so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. No, there's there's just I don't know. We've, we've again, Liberty or Equality is another book that we've just grabbed loads of stuff out for because it's just great. But uh, I think am I on the right page here? No, it's not. Uh, the, it, it's basically a, a large part of the book just revolves around lots of literature on democracy really and it's a collection of it that's just quite nicely framed 
uh, I think he starts off with there's a bit from Proudhon, which is quite good here actually. Uh, we have besides as the common expression and part of the ideas of the French Revolution and part of the demands of the modern reform movements, what is called democracy. That is an ideology emerged from a thousand different sources and highly differentiated according to the various layers of our supporters. Yet in one respect invariable that for it, the power of the state over the individual can never be sufficient. As a result, the boundary lines between state and society are obliterated and the state is expected to carry out all tasks which society might possibly neglect. At the same time, everything will be kept in a state of mobility and indecision. Finally, certain groups and castes will be given a special guarantee of work and a living wage. <clears throat> uh, which page is this on? Uh, it is, if you look up uh, page 37 and 38 in a PDF, I think it is. Uh, it will be numbered 24 and 25. Uh, 24 and 25, there we go. Um, I'm just. I put the link in the chat if you guys want to read along. Mm -hmm. um, so I will quickly put that there for people, just to make sure that people can read along with the literature yeah, if they want to. A, it's a poem from uh, Herman Melville discussing oh. uh, the entrance of Angers of Britain into China. Uh, how, of the, how of the teeming prairie land there shall the plentitude expand, unthinned, un, unawed. Myriads playing pygmy parts, debased into equality, and glut of all material arts, a civic barbarism may be. Man disennobled, brutalised, by popular science atheized, <laughs> <laughs> into a smatterer, dead level of rank commonplace, an Anglo Saxon China, see, may in your vast plains shame the race and the dark ages of democracy. <laughs> Uh, that is that is incredibly based, and is also a great kind of. It's it's like he's looking at the camera because there is no there is no communist China without the British. No, exactly. I mean, I, I was uh, talking to Jess about this uh, this morning actually because I just I always get sick of like the the wig nats that simp for China because it's so illiberal and based. And what China really is, in a sort of grander sense, is just all the worst parts of 18th and 19th century Europe, you know, accelerated through it at a horrific pace, whereby you just pick up all the all the worst of it. <laughs> so, so what's the, just a, just a purely out of interest, uh, you said that there's no communism in China without the British. Um, can you, can, you, can you go into that a bit more? Just, it sounds interesting. Well, what happens is the British come in and the international, the quote unquote international community comes in yeah, so. and basically smashes China. They do to the Chinese world what yeah. Genghis Khan did to the Islamic world. And they make it have a complete crisis of faith in itself. When, you know, it's the, it's the era of humiliation, they call it. Yeah, the great, right. you know, the yeah, long the humiliation, humiliation of China yeah. um, is really what, what shatters Chinese culture and Chinese mm -hmm. uh, civilization because mm -hmm. they think that they, you end up with Mao and you end up in the Maoist era. Uh, and the Cultural Revolution, and them yeah. thinking that they have to break from everything traditional because they think that everything traditional has failed them well, because I mean, British and, and other powers came in and just absolutely did not respect their civilization. Something something which is at the very basis of the Chinese psyche and always has been and always is, is that China is the greatest civilization there ever could, could possibly be. Um, yeah. that is the fundamental assumption and it, it never never is challenged and so that's why when the Europeans came they didn't care to adopt any of it um, uh, and in fact you could you could contrast it with Japan who have this who had an idea that um, at some point they basically adopted Chinese culture wholesale because they they basically came to the conclusion that China was the greatest um, civilization and then when the Europeans showed up, they said, okay, well, no, the Europeans must be the greatest civilization, so let's just adopt them. Mm. Where, of course, China couldn't do that because it has this fundamental idea that it, it, is, the, it, is, the, it is the greatest civilization and there is no, no rival. Um, but, of course, it's interesting because despite the century of humiliation, which, of course, as you say, you know, basically shook it to death, they never lost that. They never lost the idea that they were the greatest. So, you know, hence you get... You get the Republican era, you get Mao, etc. Kind of number one. That's yeah, exactly. All they really kept, <laughs> exactly. All, all they really kept was that weird, spiteful sense that they should somehow be superior. They lost all the artfulness. It was mm -hmm. all kind of shook out of them. 
yeah. by by the continual refusal of the outside world to to not make China into a giant vassal area. Mm-hmm. Even the idea of China as an entity as it is today is the the Europeans just came in and basically went, oh, this is this is kind of the extent that we think the Han Empire was. So we'll kind of make this like China like that never existed. China was always a collection of kingdoms, principalities, different peoples. They get nibbled on the edges by, you know, their idea of the barbarians. It was a very fluid thing. And that's really what kept China as it was during its kind of golden eras as dynamic as it was, because there wasn't a set idea of China. Mm -hmm. You know, the the idea of Han China is this retroactive thing that had to be introduced to give give back some idea of Chinese identity after the century of humiliation. Uh, Obviously, if I might, there's just continues a paragraph or two here where they keep commenting on on China, just whether it was interesting or not. This vision is admittedly cultural rather than political, but neither to Melville, nor to John Stuart Mill, nor to de Tocqueville were the deeper interconnections hidden. Mill also became a victim of this misinterpretation of China, largely a visual error, but the analysis and premonition of this fervent, though conditional friend of democratic values are as timely as today as ever. He wrote, The modern regime of public opinion is in an organised form, but the Chinese educational and political systems are in an organised and unless individuality shall be able to successfully... Oh, sorry. It will remain at our end. And an, sorry, I've completely lost that. such a... a Weirdly written sentence that I've completely thrown myself off there. Uh, the modern regime of public opinion is, in an organ, in an organised form, what the Chinese education, educational and political systems are, and an organised and unless individuality shall be able to assert itself against this yoke, Europe, notwithstanding its noble antecedents and its professed Christianity, will tend to become another China. What is it that hitherto preserves Europe from this law? What has made the European family of nations an improving instead of a stationary proportion of mankind? Not any superior excellence in them which then it exists, it exists as the effect, not the cause, but the remarkable diversity of character and culture. I don't know, I just thought that might be somewhat interesting that he's, he's, he's kind of having his own dig there at the, hmm, why are we, why are we actually different worlds here? <laughs> he, he's making the very salient point that China isn't a country, it's an area. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 the, this is uh, I'm trying to think who raised this point. It was the other week. They said that they said that the greatest mistake every Westerner makes is to think of China as a country. It's not a country. It's 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 a civilization. Mm. Like it's it's you can't think of it in terms of the Western nation states because that concept is simply alien to them. Well, yeah, it's it's like a a greater form in some sense of a. Maybe we we think of like un uncontacted tribes. Yeah. You know they they were to the the eighteenth century that you know that big uncontacted contacted tribe of the east that was mysterious in the way that we look at ones that are much smaller and you know rarer in the jungle nowadays. But in a certain sense, that must have been the way that there would have been relations between these people. There've been a lot less the, than the way we think now, whereby. You know, in a certain sense, Mill is correct here that we are a lot more like China now than we were before. Yes, and I, I, is, that's probably partly our fault, or <laughs> if not, almost completely our fault. <laughs> well, it's also the issue that you you get with like the global experiment, the idea of the global monoculture. And imposing the global monoculture on these far-flung corners of the world with completely different traditions, completely different histories, uh, you end up with these, you know, traumatized people. It's also another great example of, you know, a lot of people reach back to the British Empire and say how based it was, but it really was just a big gay globalist experiment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Cecil Rhodes was was yeah. the precursor to all of this modern Faustian liberalism. Turn of the all century, re- George Bush. It was yes. it was it was all just done in the name of mercantilism and, mm. and and trade networks and stock jobbing. I mean, the 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 thing about the British and the European empires in general, I think to I mean to clarify, yes, there were heroic men who went out and did heroic things within that framework, but the framework itself itself stood for nothing more than the material at the end of the day. Yes, you know, it simply didn't. It had no greater meaning than 
then well we need this piece of land so that the french don't have it and also uh we can force this inland area to start trading its gold to us you know it, it's it's that's really what drove it you know well, yeah, and, I've, then, I've, and then I've... and then it was just it was just kind of piggybacked on by politicians as this great this great kind of psyop of you know britain is now the greatest empire in the world you know look at all this it's like yeah but what does it stand for you know what why why do why does britain own the caribbean and and parts of africa and india like why does this exist you know why it's just just geopolitics trade yeah well it's, it's kind of interesting as well you can look at the what what is touted as much of the the modernization of the third world under the you know uh, british empire could actually just be argued as a consequence of the fact that British people at the time, even now, or even then, sorry, relative to the sort of, you know, 18th century third worlders, must have lived such a softer, especially the bourgeois, such a sort of softer and cushier life that they thought, well, if we, you know, if we're going to rule over this place, we can't live like the people of this place. Mm-hmm. And it is from there that it becomes no wonder that. The people who are of the, that place can no longer relate to it anymore because they are ruled by someone who doesn't want to even on just their own personal level of convenience live in you know india or pakistan or wherever mm-hmm. it is and the way that they found it <laughs> you know in, in yeah, such exactly. a simple kind of human comfort level it, it and, just and this, leads to corruption this this whole idea that you go and you bring civilization it's like all you've done is bring liberalism to some of the most traditionally metaphysical mm. places on earth i mean the, the the fact that the fact that britain entered india when it was a kind of mon- monarchic um kind of half federation of kind of warrior states and kind of the most traditional one of the most rigid caste systems in the world and then and then they they left it with a republican centralized parla- like sort of parliament and a and a prime minister you know and and the 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 abolition of all the royalty you know i think you know you if if someone's going to turn and say well the british empire was based you're going to have to answer that question it's like well then why did why was britain's greatest legacy in india gandhi you know who was a who was a middle class british educated lawyer you know you have activist to... lawyer so you also have to look at the state that Britain found itself in after the imperial era, that we we reach these we you know we are this long running civilization that thought in civilizational terms or at least in multi generational terms at first, and you look at the period of the empire, it is essentially Britain setting itself on fire to achieve this. Mm. Um, it comes out of the imperial era broken and ruined and, yeah. and subjugated in many ways. Well, it becomes an outpost of America. Mm-hmm. And um, part of part of the reason that um it was it was it was such a I mean the, really we're, we're still living with this now is this problem that we structured our entire society around the empire and the idea of empire the whole like for example the reason that the British public schools turned out the way they did was literally to educate bureaucrats to run the empire you know. Um, the way that the the way the military evolved, the way the way certain political ideas evolved, it was all bait. It was all to keep this empire going. And then the trouble is that we miss. We began to to take that as just being what we do in Britain as a kind of as a kind of uh, fundamental way. And then once the as soon as the empire collapsed and went away, um, you've now got this issue of kind of a, a, a an engine without a car. See what I mean? Well, I think it was self perpetuating. Yes. It was just futile on so many levels, though. Even down to like the the silly stuff of, you know, in a certain sense we can look at it. You know, we we brought toilets to nations that didn't know how to use them, and then when we finally spent centuries teaching them how to use them, we thought, Nah, I'll still squat over a hole in the ground and wipe my arse right. my hand. They don't you care. Can, <laughs> they just like can, everything we take, take is, water. yeah, everything we take is like you know that as you're saying. The, in some sense now the pillars of our society because it was so you know almost kind of a bourgeois in a sense compared to these other nations Mm -hmm. you know our pillars did become things like cleanliness and like living for ages and you know those those very base ideas of material progress and that ultimately you know we're coping just for the fact that we can't we can no longer be satisfied with shitting in a hole in the ground 
<laughs> there's uh there's a few uh we're getting towards the top of the hour here so there's a few uh super chats and uh streamlabs donations built up uh so i will i will quickly read those out because we have a few of them here um we have one here from uh ipa is global homo juice still one of my favorite names um he says just a donation to congratulate you all on the success of the latest no must event also scrum by appreciate your senator armstrong posting a few weeks ago summed up my feelings perfectly about the vapid things people still talk about over real issues yeah that was uh that was me dumping on the slap discourse uh i only did a bit of it because i didn't want to i didn't want to become hating the discourse of the new discourse because that's just as cringe but yeah i was i was posting some uh some pets uh, around strong from uh from uh, metal gear rising uh, also i meant to make a a, a a rules of nature joke when we we're talking about natural law um but I, i'll make that now uh glowy donated two dollars and says the constant changing of laws seems uh, more a liberal problem due to constant redefining of things, thus disrupting people's understanding of, of the uh, phrase or words. If people have the same understanding of things, very little needs to be said. That is true. It becomes definition, musical chairs, and deliberately confusing to people. Um, uh, Aurelian uh, Northeast Caesar, uh, another $5 donation, says, China was only ever advanced when it was ruled by the Mongols. Uh, when they took uh, back power, they believed they didn't need to. They didn't need to do anything, or they believed they didn't need anything. Uh, yeah, I, I think China became a little too navel gazing, but that's you know the, the problems of Chinese civilization are no excuse for the the vassal nature of how it was treated, and then we've ended up with the again the reaction that is communist China, and them now doing what they're doing as a as a direct result of uh, of the century of humiliation. Mm -hmm. um, Again, we need to train ourselves to think on more civilizational I mean, timescales than immediate timescales. I don't want to say that like Chairman Mao was entirely correct, but imperial <laughs> forces did <laughs> enslave his people with the uh, division of labor, in a certain sense. Yeah, well, the, a, a great example of this, actually, is the introduction by the West of the rickshaw into mm. asia because everyone assumes that the rickshaw was this traditional asian thing it wasn't it was introduced by a western businessman in the 1800s the rickshaw and the reason it was so um kind of shocking and the reason it works as an example is because it's it's replaceable wage labor yeah because you you that person pulling that rickshaw means nothing he's he's fungible as, as soon as he's too tied to pull the rickshaw anymore you just get someone else and you stop paying him you know, and you pay the other person a pittance to do it. You know, that was the, the introducing that to Asia was quite shocking uh, because they were they previously they were a much more feudal um, idea of what work was and this, this kind of idea of the, the, that you that the, this idea that you served somebody in particular. You know, you served a lord, or you served an order, or you served you. you the idea of just you know, as, as you say, basically, you know. Uh, Western liberalism and the things that we've come to develop over the last few hundred years are objectively bad to any healthy civilization. And I understand what you're saying, basically, that, yeah, um, in a sense, the, the, the West kind of, in a sense, did introduce the Chinese to a new form of slavery mm. um, by via kind of capitalistic um, modes of labor, shall we say. Well, I think uh, I think actually I can hear Stargon reading them. <laughs> I might I might jump, but we can come back to some of the uh, Qnote laden points. There is one from Elul. It's page two hundred and thirty-seven in the PDF of the Technological Society, and it's in the section where he discusses technique and economy, and he begins to discuss the the naturally authoritarian nature of a technologically organized economy. And I think that some of the points he makes in it in regards to the way that law and natural law was before is actually quite interesting. <clears throat> An economy completely founded on technique cannot be a liberal economy. This is not entirely the same as the preceding idea. Technique is, in reality, opposed to liberalism, a social form which is unable to absorb and utilise modern techniques. It seems clear that economic liberalism is not in a, is, sorry, is not and in itself a technique. In fact, the attitude represented by laissez-faire, however much mitigated it may have become, 
is a renunciation of the use of techniques. Techniques suppose conscious human action, not abstention from action. Which is, there is a little unironically flexing that he's probably got like 190 IQ and is like a super genius. <laughs> Despite the fact that he's French and I should, be, I should hate him, but I can't. <laughs> When liberalism requires men to put their trust in the obscure alchemy of certain natural laws, it in effect restrains them from making use of the technical means at their disposal. This means, or sorry, this means, uh, this means permits men to intervene in the order of nature, to adjust its laws to their purposes, and to exploit them as in the physical order. They, they also permit intervention that would appear to contradict natural laws and modify the order of nature. It is clear, then, that they are not really laws at all. In view of this, technique does not accord these non-existent laws the respect recommended by liberalism. Therefore, when technique develops, both the liberal attitude and its doctrine become impossible. I have posed the problem at its most acute by placing at it point of contact between liberalism and the economic techniques of intervention, which are the very negation of liberalism, but my thesis is just as true for the simple techniques of production, which influence the economy. As I've, as I've already shown, every mechanical technique supposes a corresponding organisation. An organisation is the diametrical opposite of free enterprise, and the organisational state of mind is the diametrical opposite of the liberal state of mind. What he's basically saying is that a centralized economic organization in a totalizing sense is incompatible with human freedom and liberalism, yes. or at least the traditional ideas of liberalism, which is a very salient point. And you're right. What, what happens is that China did have the division of labor. It did have its own economic systems, but it didn't have Western mercantilism. And that was imposed on them from outside and called civilizing. Well, it, it also didn't have the best part of the millennia to adapt itself to the growing economic techniques that are predicated upon for a larger mass society. So when they were essentially thrown into a situation of having to become a mass society in the space of a, you know less than a century, as opposed to you know at you know almost a millennia, I think it was something we actually discussed at Nomos uh, at one point, having a drink uh, after the Friday or something. That mass death in China during the communist period is not per se a problem with communist ideology. It's that if you don't have the thousands a year or the thousand year odd development and adaption to economic techniques, that communism then does this. And that's not to say that communism would work if you were perfected to economic techniques, but that its effects are less damaging over a longer period of time. Yeah, the, the, it's the same thing really that's been happening in places like India um, post-Raj. It's the same things really that happened in Britain that ended up with the kind of Dickensian myth, as it were. It happened slower mm. here and there was a less degree. And if you look at the, you know, especially the currency stabilization in Britain, the situation was a lot better than a lot of historians give it credit for, but it was still it still ended up with the conditions as they were in the cities with this this lurch, you know, the British Great Leap Forward, as it were, uh, that caused this period of, of abject human misery uh, in certain quarters that was then seized on by the socialists mm. as a, an excuse for even more rapid development. And uh, it just become, it becomes like a self-perpetuating engine in that the problems of civil, the natural problems of advancing too quickly uh, end up as justifications for even faster advancement, in quotes. I might continue on here, actually, because I forget some of this is quite interesting. It almost goes reactionary for a minute. It will doubtless be pointed out by way of refutation that production techniques were developed during the ascendancy of liberalism, which furnished a favourable climate for their development and understood perfectly how to use them. This is no counter-argument. The simple fact is that liberalism permitted the development of its own executioner. Exactly as in a healthy tissue, a constituent cell may proliferate and give rise to a fatal cancer. The health of the body represented the necessary condition for the cancer, but there was no contradiction between the two. The same relation holds between technique and economic liberalism. Here, then, is the locus of the conflict between technique and the liberal economy, which Younger, among others, has studied. Technique is inevitably opposed to the liberal economy because the end of technique is efficiency and rationality, and the end of liberalism is money profit. 
Technique requires of the liberal economy non-profitable decisions and risks. For example, when expensive new machines are developed before the old ones have been amortised, the industrialist is forced to liquidate the old machines or he runs the risk of being eliminated from the market. This conflict, sorry, conflict holds good on all levels. When the state controls the economy, it faces similar problems, but such problems affect every economy. In this perspective, planning is criticised as wasteful, yet the very criticism shows that the liberal mentality is still in force. Which I think is an interesting point. You know, we are all, in the way that Mises would discuss, self-interest in a sense that we wish to develop either physical or psychic profit by going from state A to state B. And that that's the sort of mode of, you know, almost task management that humans have naturally when they engage with the world. And because of that, we anachronistically look at a lot of technique through that lens and it ultimately, you know, pre-programs us in a certain sense to be just looking for efficiency because that same, as he's saying, the, the, the end before of, liberal social organization is seeking out your own end but ultimately understanding you're seeking out your own end because you have to play your part in a community whereas that's that no longer holds as the the sort of basic social condition for those who are part of you know a more specialized economy where there is a a deeper and wider net of the division of labor with more complex tasks within it mm -hmm. It's it's basically a law making fun of the the quote unquote economic liberals going you can't do that you can't be traditional that's inefficient. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, um, funnily enough, uh, this is a critique of this. This is a kind of pro capitalist thing that uh, AA used to say all the time. He used to um, he used to criticize India post Britain for its. Uh, some of its attempts to to kind of return to a traditional form of economy or to maintain the traditional economies that survived, um, especially in, of course, the vast Indian textile industry. Um, so uh, yes, I know that this is uh, this is something that we don't because a lot of the criticisms, of course, we face from leftists, but this is mainly from some, something from within our own circles that comes yes. up a lot. Yes, you know? um, very very much a kind of uh, uh, dark horse. Uh, well, it's, I think it's, it's a point that is completely and utterly missed, that if you have no central body for the organisation of society, then you furthermore have no central body with which to impose all of the aspects of modernity upon a society. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, you, you can't have the monopoly on violence without the, you know, the monopoly on organisation. Mm. It's, 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 a, it's a point that, I, again, that I make in my... Uh, a little bit in my kind of American disease uh, piece, but it's just like, like, look, what if the Afghanis just want to sit in caves, herd goats, and read the Quran Which and not have electricity? Want. Yeah. Literally. Like, what, what if these people do not want to be advanced? What, what if, what, you know, what if the Africans just want to walk the plains and live in mud huts? Yeah, no, they, they are literally <laughs> in the condition of Adam and Eve. They're happy to wipe their shit with their bare hands and they don't care. So, like, let no. them, let them revel in that. <laughs> Who was it that used to tell the anecdote about the um, the African society? This, this, um, I think it was uh, somewhere in West Africa. An American tire company went out there and established a rubber plantation. And um, they hired a bunch of local Africans who would come and harvest the rubber, and then they would get the pay at the end of the day. And the Americans um, uh, wanted uh, the, employ the employees to work harder. So they doubled the pay rate. And so the Africans only showed up half the amount of hours. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because they, because they, 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 the American company assumed that, like an American worker who just wants more and more money, these Africans were being paid an amount of money that suited them. So they didn't like they didn't. So when they said, "Okay, well, we're, we're going to pay you twice the hourly rate," it's not much work half the hours though. Because we like there, there, there simply isn't that that instinctive. Kind of what, uh, kind of Western jump for the for the higher wage. It's just mm. you know we're we're okay. But you I think know, that, like... that that to me seems like one of those things that people would reflexively just blame on liberalism, mm -hmm. and th the problem is so much deeper than that. You know, materialism is a condition of modernity, not just because liberalism existed as a set of ideas. It's a whole, it's a whole lot more of that process than that. Yeah. You know, one. You, 
it, even... it, it, it has to totally infect the minds of everybody in a sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, order for it to work. in a certain sense, I mean, I, I always, I always bring up Lenin, but it's just because he's a perfect example of what I think of when it comes to totalizing a society, yeah. getting an entire, you know, landmass of people to, to all mobilize either for one purpose or to one organization. Mm-hmm. And, and the, and the way of looking at it is all mobilizing for one purpose. Edward Bernays basically did that for, you know, American liberalism, as we are told. But if you look at it in a purely technical sense, both Lenin and Bernays tasked themselves with mobilizing a mass populace. It was just well, that one did yeah. it via socialist methods and one did it via what we know as capitalist methods. But th- this is this is the I think Lenin, in a sense, is the kind of logical conclusion to the liberal project. I mean, look at what Napoleon achieved immediately after the French Revolution, where he he basically was able to take a state and use it as a weapon, just mm. point it at enemies. You know, just send the entire resources and manpower of the state at your enemies and and he managed to conquer pretty much all of europe i mean you know and the whole reason behind the famous book by um clausewitz uh uh, on war that isn't really a book about tactics it's a book about how to how to basically mobilize the state to point its resources at people i mean that is what prussia became you know that's what germany evolved into and then and then all the states of europe kind of also took 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 this kind of revolutionary napoleonic uh <laughs> form um and then of course you just have the the first and second world wars and the and the and the ensuing chaos i mean that is basically the, the shadow we we live in the people always kind of like to meme about this you know what why do you reactionaries say that the french revolution was the worst thing to happen it's because it was the final tap that that let that opened up the floodgate essentially to hmm. to to people being able to completely mobilize the uh, path, you know, the, the the state. This and 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 I, I should point out as well. I'm not an absolutist for this reason because I think that um, monarchical absolutism and the French model was what kind of set this up in a sense. It's yeah. what because if you have a kind of decentralized europe as such you you can't really do that because the state the nation state as we know it doesn't really exist in that context you you it, it's quite difficult to get i don't know somebody from provence to go and fight a war for a king in paris you know because they, the the interests are sort of close but not that close um the, and of course you know you 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 have things that unite them you have the kind of identity you have the you have the Christianity as such, but unless that grand idea, the grand ultimate metaphysics of Christianity is threatened, generally uh, disputes and wars remain local. Um, yes. Well, yeah, we can we can almost maybe look at it and, and contrast between, you know, it was just the nature of the conditions and the, the, the so-called dark ages that mobilized people, because whether the, you know, if they, if they didn't get up and engage with basic agricultural labor they starve to death whereas yeah. once you have some sort of subsistence not say uh, not subsistence sorry some sort of basic level of subsistence that is produced by the, the excess of industrial society then you have to then have the you know the form that i see always and I, radlib enjoyed the fact that i made this point the other day on the uh, telegram that you know there was a subset of the right, far right, distant right, whatever, that has pure and utter adulation for Uncle H, as we might call him, purely and simply for the fact Mr. that... Mr. 88, yes. Yeah, um, purely and simply for the fact that he mobilised the German people and forced them through, and we, what you can see in the Maoist sense is the perfect mould of the National Socialist citizen. And that, that almost feeds all the way back to your point you mentioned earlier on about you know, Hobbes first seeing people as citizens of the state and social contract theory that, you know, it is in some sense is accurate to then suggest that that can lead to what you end up with in yeah, mid-century Germany. But it's not the, It's not because of the, the, the nature of the ideas, it's the nature of the conditions. Yeah, and the, the H-man is just another example of this. I mean, I, I don't really see 
national socialism as such is really being worthy of that much deep deep uh, consideration. Well, no one, it, it, no one can define what it is. No, exactly. <laughs> but, it, but again, it's really just there isn't really any discernible difference in method or motivation in Hitler than there is in Rus than there is in uh, Robespierre. Yeah, you know, for example, or, or FDR said the, is the good example. Or FDR, yeah, or 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 really Napoleon. You know, it, it's this this just this concept of kind of um, statist, populist, um, kind of what what would what would be a word that, that just this this kind of this ability to pick up the state and wield it like a cannon. You know, is what is what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, it, um, it ulti ultimately what it does is. Uh, Again, it, it's what Br Britain did with the British Empire and the British state is you you in you do it for short term gain, but essentially you set you know you're setting your your house on fire to keep warm. Yeah. It's not a sustainable situation, oh. and it's a again it's a point that I make when I talk about the American yeah. Empire and that it inevitably has to collapse. America is burning through its social and economic resources at an alarming rate and doing so faster than I, I think the British even did. Um, the British had maybe 200 years in that state. I think the Americans have only had about 100 since the 1920s of becoming the dominant force on the world stage. And they're already running out of steam. On a civilizational sense, they've, their speed running collapse. It, it, it simply, at, at, at the end of the day, this is the issue that, that um, goes back to uh, the foundation of America. But of course, now it's a machine with far more moving parts, so the flaws are more evident. Is that what does it stand for? You know, mm. it 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 stands for these abstract words like you know freedom and liberty and uh, all this kind of stuff, which at the end of the day they don't mean anything. They they don't they don't actually stand for anything metaphysical in a in a in a in a realistic sense. They they're just buzzwords. Like the the American bug man will sit there in his pod, like dying of malnutrition and being in being enslaved to a corporation. And going, we have freedom and liberty in this country, you know? Like it's there isn't any kind of concrete metaphysical drive to it. And then there never has been, you know. Well that's um, that's the thing I want to bring us back round to when we talk about the period of original, you know, you define the liberal era, Evelyn, really as existing pre-enlightenment mm -hmm. in, in terms of praxis, as it as it were. Um, but it's not a totalizing system, it's not a set of ideas that works in the abstract if you look at what is considered as liberalism as a set of ideas it it lacks a metaphysics it lacks a spirituality it it lacks a lot of things it reminds me of um a good example of that on the right is like randians mm -hmm. it reminds me of randianism because that's you know despite its reputation is a very uh, a very liberal in the in the classical sense set of ideas um, but it doesn't have a metaphysics. It's explicitly an atheist set of ideas. Well, it I think explicitly it's... forbids the idea of the king, and that's really what you end up with in the with the modern liberalism. In that it's liberalism stripped of everything else that went around it. It's comp it's framing uh, mechanisms. The the society it's meant to fit into, the ideas it's meant to interface with. Liberalism in the abstract is it is the the vacuous repetition of words that you're talking about, uh, Panamahat. Mm -hmm. It is like the the Americanism of it. It is the the abstract idea that you have liberalism, but you don't have you know the traditions of the nation that 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 it has to apply to. It's that's all stripped away. Well, it almost mean yeah, it almost gets you to the point of the the kind of just notion that information itself is entropy, and that anything really exists in its purest form as just action and just, you know, thought not as conscious ideology. I mean, again, something we discussed uh, the other weekend, the, the sort of notion that what you could see Robert Filmer as possibly the person you could blame for the downfall of monarchy because he's the first person who... You know, takes it and and explains it. explains it all in one go and freezes it in place in a sort of sense so that other people can then argue against it, whether rightly or wrongly. But before that explicit definition of it, though, there was, you know, the arguing of it has to be done in a purely subjective and a much more human sense, and that was very much the same case for liberalism. 
I would um I would I would say that Filmer see the the issue with Filmer is that I agree with with what you're saying, but the, the contents of his writings are correct, mm. but just as you say, he's elucidated them and now he's kind of intellectualized it. Yes, um, the, as opposed to it being an actuality. But Whereas by speaking the word off, he's ruined it. <laughs> I, I I think I think it's I would um at this point just thinking about kind of monarchy and absolutism, I would I would bring up this whole issue with the word liberalism. Mm. So it's obviously drawn from the word liberty. And over the course of its history, we've basically lost really the meaning of what liberty is. People just keep saying it. But prior to the um prior to the modern era, liberty had a very concrete idea. It was a concrete definition. And it was something that existed in most Western European societies in some way. Like, for example, the idea that the, like, the British, no, well, not British, but say the English, um, the English free man in, like, you know, 1410, for example, has various liberties accorded to him um, by God and by his lords, for example. Um, the idea that the lord himself or the knight or any particular level of the hierarchy has liberties accorded to it with their standing um just as everybody does um but the idea of this kind of universal catchword of liberty just did not exist you wouldn't have applied it like that mm. um this whole idea of universal liberty is basically a spook in my opinion it, it doesn't exist <laughs> well yeah it was i mean this is an argument i used to have with some of the ancap kind of people and I think I, I might as well flash this image back up because we're we're getting in some hoppy and talking points. But yes, that you know, in the same sense that Filmer says, when did the na the state of nature actually exist? Like, when were you ever free? Freedom and liberty <laughs> is the product of yeah. a society that predated you, and in, in some form of order for centuries, if not millennia. It is only because of that consistent and lasting and permanent order. That you have what you can call liberty, insofar as I mean, maybe even to tap into what's you know thought of to commonly as the Marxist definition, but liberty from the conditions and necessities that nature puts upon you. Yeah, I mean, well, there's, yeah, sorry, go on. I mean, this this whole idea that you know man is born free. It's like no, you aren't. You're, mm. you're born like <laughs> this. This you, this has been pointed out by people far less based than than me. But you know, it's like. You you um you're born this kind of crying, mewling infant that can't take care of itself and will die without a mother and a father to look after it. And you know, it, like what if what if you're born to like some family on the Mongol plains who are then immediately wiped out by there's, an invading tribe? Like you know, there's you're not owed anything by this by life. There's you're an even anything. there's an even greater point. We I think you could argue that. The very conception of your own birth is the negation of your choice to not live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember you and other people having that argument with, like, the ANCAP people and the 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 people who you know the the hardcore ANCAP pure ethicalist. It's like, okay, are are people free to not choose to be born? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So like you you are aggressed upon by your by by the 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 abstract ethical oh, definitions of like I mean, the ancaps you were aggressed upon by your parents because you didn't ask to be born. <laughs> in, a, in an absolute philosophical sense, I agree with what Camus said that the only philosophical question is whether or not to commit suicide. Um, <laughs> that's, 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 really, that's, that's so good. That's the only philosophical question that actually exists. Um, and basically, all philosophy, all metaphysics, all religion. Is is an answer to that question? It's saying no. Um, the the that you shouldn't you shouldn't basically that the, the the negation of of nihilism and of course as as we know we're now living at a point where the only thing keeping I think most people from killing themselves is pretty much just consumption and material. It's like all those posts yeah. about people getting cancer and wanting to see the next Avengers movie early because they don't want to oh, die no. without having seen yeah. it. Yeah. Like, my, don't, don't kill yourself. My friend never got to see the end of Game of Thrones. It's like, well, Christ. Yeah. I mean, thank, thank God he did. 
<laughs> is, I was going to say, that's yeah. it for some people, though. They have no higher purpose. Yeah. And in a theological sense, in terms of the, you know, when was the state of nature, if you, if you go by the Christian tradition, you could say, well, man was free when he wasn't burdened with knowledge. Mm, Therefore, yeah. exactly. sentient... When, when he wasn't really man. Yeah. It's yeah. like, every, every, if you asked anyone who was capable of understanding the question is not free. <laughs> that's that's what I'd say. Anyone who can think about their freedom in the abstract is not free and has never been free. And, mm. and the, the the whole reason that I'm so keen, like my answer to all this is just, well, you need to return to a kind of faith, is because, um, the closest thing we can get to freedom is a kind of autonomy under God, essentially. Mm. When you when you fully realize what what you are and then accept it, that's basically that's the best thing we can get for freedom. This is a point I was going to get onto. Hopefully, was that even someone like John Locke again, who's who's lambasted as oh, liberal nonsense, he only ever recognized that you were free under God if you were a white man, <laughs> and that was that was how it worked. That to him, that was how you got liberty. Was you were you were free under your recognition of God as a white man and that was basically it mm-hmm. and as you're saying that it, it because of that recognition that you are not assumptively free i mean the, the tweet i had a while back that like triggered so many folk and i thought it was really funny was that you know a society that believes you are born in enslavement will free you but a society that believes you are born in freedom and an absolute freedom can only ever enslave you that's a good point exactly uh, it's in in the abstract. I again, it's the whole thing of uh, the. Uh, there's an argument I saw again between the ANCAPs and people. I wish I could find it. I think the guy's account got suspended, but he just he goes on this absolutely surgically precise series of arguments where it's like, look, the only by your definition, the only person who would could truly be free is the last modern Earth, and he he would he would be free in that he could not be aggressed against by other human beings and his 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 interests will never conflict with theirs but he would be completely alone and completely miserable and he would have no you know no bonds of family it's the things that stop us from being free really that are that are the essential parts of the human experience like being part of a family yeah but imagine how much time you would have for playing nintendo switch games yeah 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 he 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 gets so much yeah he, he so much bang gets, bang wahoo Oh, God. Think about that man's grind set. But I mean, to, like, to, again, to, to, to pare it down to an even more <laughs> basic philosophy, I mean, I have this maxim um, taken from a philosopher that man is born a rebel because his own nature disgusts him, essentially. That you... That he, basically, to to me, what a human is is this twisted halfway point between a beast and and the image of God. Essentially, the fact that the fact that man is cognizant to recognize his kind of bestial nature, but also his ability to move towards the divine in areas like, say, art or philosophy, is it's this kind of great contradiction. And if you if you don't if the kind of liberal philosophies that teach that man is this kind of perfect uh you know being that is basically enslaved by other men it's well no it's because even if you even if you just are the last man on earth i think you're still in chains because you're still man well, you you're still yes. you 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 you're still you're still having to battle against your own desires and vices and own failings and own weaknesses in order to do anything yeah, you know? the, the the last man on earth would probably still wear clothes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He'd he'd still feel the shame, <laughs> and that's the point. Yeah, you're you're. That's why I don't like a lot of the transhumanist stuff so much. That's why I think it's so destructive. It's like eventually we'll move beyond human limits, guys. It's like no, no, you no, won't, you because your human brain can't understand things I I, beyond human. I I I, I like we'll to think that some of the some of the worst chambers of hell are reserved for transhumanists and luxury yes. space communist types i i i honestly think that just that they deserve the worst levels of hell you know just they, they would quite literally surrender their humanity for yes, exactly. a slightly less for a slightly shorter queue you mm-hmm. know for a exactly. for, for a millisecond quicker starbucks so they, it's they all can, right though they, because they can, uh... they, they can have a soy milkshake sent to their house three three yeah. minutes than we do it now you know 
No, uh, Elon Musk is going to set up a based Twitter. But the yeah. only way you get in is if you uh, tweet using your Neuralink and you literally post your thoughts online. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Yeah. Um, the, the message got redacted. I'm not sure why. But uh, HS in the chat asked us if we'd ever, ever yeah, shot any kind of firearms. I have. Um, I think we all Many. have. <laughs> I, yes. I, before, before COVID, I used to go shooting all the time. And uh, I'll I'll tell you what's even more fun than uh, than hunting with a with a shotgun is fox hunting with hounds and horse. That's uh, you want if, if if you want some so some way to piss off the libs as well. Yeah, like, people they will foam up the mouth. Guns. They really hate. Uh, I mean, it's like, but they, they they the people that the people that hate it all live in the city and they go to universities. They don't actually live in the cut. They don't. They've 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 they've, they've never seen. They, they they've never had that that countryside experience of waking up in the morning and seeing a trail of blood leading out of your hen house or your sheep pen and then yeah. just mutilated animals all over the place like once once you've seen that you can fox hunt as much as you want you you it'll ne it'll ne there'll never be a moral quandary to killing fox after that it's like the horrendous overpopulation of badges we've got exactly. and the, like we're not even allowed to manage the countryside anymore. No. People get upset because you're you're shooting like actual environmental pests. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it's, cool. it, <laughs> it, it's like the uh, all the people getting upset that they have to hunt elephants now because there's too many. Like the the conservation mm -hmm. as, uh, efforts were too successful, and they're literally rampaging, destroying huge parts of the countryside in parts of Africa because there's yeah. too many elephants because they have no actual predators. <laughs> um, but yes, I've 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 done the least of my shooting in Britain. Really, I've done quite a bit when I've been in the US, and I've also every time I've been to Eastern Europe, I've I've been shooting. I'm probably on some kind of list because I underwent uh, quite a few years ago a little bit of firearms training in Serbia. In Serbia, um, <laughs> this is a bit of deep law. Are you are you, are you in training for the militia? No, I just I like Eastern Europe's a good cheap holiday, so I've been to the Ukraine before. Um, which is why I find the current discourse so tragic, because not many people have actually been there. Um, I actually went as a as a tourist in about 2010 to uh, Chernobyl yeah. uh, with a proper guide, the proper guide system, and I had a good time there. Um, that's how I know that Ukraine is basically an open arms dump, and the <laughs> idea that we need to pump weapons in there is ridic ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it's like no because... one's seen the, the Nick Cage classic Lords of War. Yes, yes. My, I, lo I like that film very much. Um, I, I I had a very famous trip to the range in 2018 in America um, <laughs> <laughs> that that resulted in the closure of Cal Arts, um, but we don't talk about that one. Oh. Um, but yes, I, to, to sum up, everyone here has had a probably far higher than average degree of, of range time than, than most British people. For a British stream, we are quite well trained. Probably enough of that chat. <laughs> yes, there's enough of that. There's enough of that. Uh, we have one more super chat before we kind of come to a rounding out of the stream here. Uh, Glowy donated another two dollars and said, um, "An abstraction with no grounding will not work in reality. Reality, liberalism has become an abstraction of an abstraction. Um, we assert this thing. Why? Because it's right. Why is it right? Uh, something we are born with." Uh, you know, basically he's saying it, it's it's good because it's right, because it's good, because it's liberal, because it's right, because it's good. Yes, which is, is the situation we found ourselves in. Um, uh, S. Smith donated five dollars. He said, "Great story from NL. I think that's maybe not. I'm not sure where that's from. Uh, certain conservationists preferred uh, large wild cattle in a nature reserve, starving to death of culling them because that would be nice. Um, I'm not sure NL." I'm not sure what that is, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's that tends to be the case. And there is very bad management. The worst people to manage natural environments are environmentalists because mm. yeah. they don't understand the cycle of life and death. Yeah, they have, they have. Well, again, there's a brilliant um, piece of writing by my patron saint uh, Joseph de Maestra, um, mm. where he goes on this kind of very violent uh, rant uh, about. Uh, about um, the fact that all life is this kind of bloody struggle between species, you know, like he 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 makes he makes this point about how you know man needs clothes, so he has to you know cut open the throats of animals and tear off their skins to clothe himself. He takes out their organs to feed himself. He he tears the guts out of 
um out of animals and then makes like cello strings out of them for music you know like and, and then you look at nature it's just animals killing each other constantly in a in a in a kind of systematic way and in an environment that sustains that and he says this is what life is this is the demonstrable truth of life and we can't hide from that you know it's it's built on an altar of blood in a sense um and he he, he of course takes us to its philosophical conclusion he says because of course he's he's writing immediately after the revolution has just happened in france and everything is washed with blood and he's saying you know this is the punishment of god for upsetting the natural order you know that the we, we we think we're above the kind of the reality of life being being so kind of um steeped in blood but it, it happens to us too and it will it will happen you know we we can't escape that you know like mm. life will be we, we we pay with our lives for such heresies well, no, that's that's a point that uh, Kunal Leiden touches on it several times. I mean, he he essentially states that given uh, the spread of ideas like humanism and atheism, that any sort of mass governing body is eventually just going to have to build itself on blood because it will run out of everything else. And that almost in a sort of sense that like the the last ditch move for all political organizations is some form of genocide it's, i think I'm yeah. to say though, i think really one last thing i think i'd want to touch on as we're sort of closing the stream is just the i don't know i've kind of mentioned a few times just the complete and utter ignorance and the really shoddy way that liberalism is dealt with from the right by so many people i mean i just i think there should be no you know, for, not just no forgiveness for it, but there should be no excuses for it anyway. So much of what, you know, people just turn around and be like, oh, well, civil rights is liberalism. Well, it's not actually. Because if you understand the tradition, the tradition of liberalism and how it functioned in the world, civil rights is completely anathema to the way that it functioned. And I don't understand why it seems like people who really should know better will just always fall for that stuff i don't know if they're doing it because it's just easy or because they genuinely just don't know it's it's part of the issue of hyper reality they they don't actually have <clears throat> any kind of proper grasp of the way life is because they've not been educated properly mm. uh, they've not been taught because i mean so one of the um a a, a project that um Barrow and I and some others have been talking about is of course because of course some of us are having have had children some of us are going to have children soon and we're talking about kind of how to educate children in in the modern world and one of the issues is that modern education doesn't educate you it does the opposite it removes your ability to think critically about anything that's why that's why the normie problem is is so severe and the fact that even kind of high level high level university types just have these kind of npc normie brains where they 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 just toe a line and never think realistically about anything and part of the reason we think this is because back in the day you would have been educated one of the first things you would have been taught was the ancient greek tragedies and the bible um and of course what those two things teach you is basically a very anti-humanist, cynical, but ultimately correct view of what mankind is and what how man interacts with, with, with itself. And, of course, what that means is that you would go on to be able to engage with reality as it stands. But, of course, now you're not taught any of that. You're just taught, you're taught abstractions, in a sense. You're, you're just taught kind of facts um, that don't lend themselves to anything. You're... you're you, you're never actually made to think in any meaningful way. And as such, you, you come out worse off, I think, than if you had not gone to school. Have you, have, have you, have you I mean, you know that meme about uh, the, the IQ curve, where you've got the, <laughs> yes. extremely, the extremely stupid man on one end and the extremely, oh, we have... extremely clever man on the other, you know? But then, and they're, they're, fun, they're fundamentally aligned. The, the man with no schooling and the man with the best schooling both basically believe the same thing. It's the kind of midwit in the middle that insists on all these kind of liberal falsities, you know? Um, because I think that ultimately the, 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 the best education, all it does is confirm natural human prejudices. That's, that's actually all it really does. <laughs>
So yeah, that's the. Uh, I'll I'll put it in the I'll put it in the chat there. But we have made memes our own means of of this, uh, because we we did have a big dunk on the horseshoe theory. Mm. So uh, it's it's yeah, it's <laughs> it's the whole like good things are good and bad things are bad. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, well, how do I, so how do you define that? It's like what I think is good is good. What I think is bad is bad. It's like you you can't really get around that subjective nature of how humans think. No, you to, to pretend to be able to abstract yourself out of that is to is to undergo a large like process of self delusion. You you might as well maximize what you think is good and minimize what you think is bad. And you should never like apologize for doing that process because it's how you interact with the world. And to 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 not do that is to surrender to to other people and their ideas and the the false neutrality. That's really how you end up with that. Um, yeah, the education system is an important aspect of that because you end up again with people thinking that there is the neutral position when you know to to adopt the postmodern position, which in that sense is correct. That there is no objective politics. There is no you know, when it comes to human organization, there is no objective ethics without God or without the deification of nature. Man is not uh, enough. Well, see, yeah. yeah, I was gonna say that's why we we no longer have our liberalism that worships God. Liberalism ended up just worshiping man in the form of democracy. If yeah. if if that's even fair to say that it, it carried on into the tradition, which I don't think it did. I think as soon as you you separate. The, the metaphysical aspect of God and try and patchwork in some notion of the people or popular sovereignty or, you know, it, it, any sense of universalism that isn't metaphysical in that sense, that it's just, it's a complete and utter failure just waiting to happen. I mean, so it's someone in the chat saying, uh, the el- elder man or whatever, at some point Sargon needs to be brought up in this idea of England as a Protestant nation. Its foundations and great institutions are Catholic. And not exactly. He... He has to have this historionic view of Britain as Protestant Britain and Protestant England. British exceptionalism. Yeah, yeah. I, I not just for that, not just for that sense of exceptionalism and nationalism, but because then he gets to look at it as a a singular people that would necessitate a system of democracy. I mean, mm. I think I know that there was that complete shit show that happened on a a stream at one point where he basically yeah. spurred at Charlemagne for like two hours and he just left. I think it, yeah. I think it would be funny just to like pin him down on a debate at one point or like how can you reconcile your position as someone who is a right wing or at least not left wing and be mm-hmm. a liberal with your complete and utter what seems like adulation for democratic governance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean this is a point I raised to him on a stream we did with AM. Um <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. I, I remember um, that one as well. I, I don't think I, he ever I, addressed it any. Check. No, it's still it's still loading. Connect stream software to start a preview. Oh, there we go. I I think it might be back. Uh. Well, OBS is still streaming. That's yes, still I can see it on the back end that we're still going. So yeah. let let us. Sorry Sorry about again. that, guys. We we had a slight internet dropout. Yeah. Straight back to it then. Um. Yes, you. So you, you were saying you have this argument with the liberal types for years. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've 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 had this discussion for years with people, and the the problem is again you can lead the horse to water but you can't make a drink. Mm-hmm. And what happens is that you might be able to cajole and poke them into agreeing with you in the moment. You might be able to beat them with the undeniable logic that the will of one person shouldn't dictate the will of the other. That's just, you know, unless someone is, volu- you know, in a community or a family with someone, then the will of someone thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away shouldn't affect, you know, the choices of somebody else. That is pure, pure imposition. It's, it's mm-hmm. you know, purely immoral. Well, I, I but don't... then when asked if they support democracy, they go, well, of course, you know, it's the best system. I, you know, I don't it's... even necessarily think it's that. It's more so trying to get to the realist sort of position of, you know, if you can get them to the agree that someone must rule, then why will they not agree to having someone who at least rules in earnest? And that functionally, yes. the, the, the whole concept of collective sovereignty or group sovereignty doesn't work because mm-hmm. you cannot have 
as many as a hundred or you know sorry as many as a thousand or even a hundred minds really singularly agree on anything because it's just not how humans work <laughs> yeah exactly and i mean the i i raised the point to him as well that well that you look man has to be governed in some way and there are there are certain truths and certain hard facts about power and we can either ignore those and suffer or we can ennoble them and work with them and live in accord with them. And to me, that's what, for example, say, early European feudalism was. It was a society in accordance with the with the nature of of nature of human society and the will of God. Um, and I pointed out that, well, you know, let's 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 re let's rewind even to say like fifteen hundred England you your your local power the, the the power to whom you account account locally will be your local baron say or your local earl and you'll know who that person is you'll know things about them you'll have spoken to them you'll have seen them in the street every day you'll you'll have you'll you'll have an engagement with them and and i said that well of course this means that they're close enough that you can punch them you know if if in in comparison to this this bizarre system where you might elect a local MP who then goes off to London, and you know we 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 all know. Let's not even pretend that parliamentarianism or congressional systems have are really about local representation at all because they aren't. No, no, um, no member of Parliament, for example, has ever really had local interests at heart unless he literally lives there and has established in interests there, you know, and and cares for that community in some way. Which in most cases it doesn't work like that. You just get an MP parachute established in, from from the party. You know, that's it. You we we need to stop, or they need to stop believing in these fictions about the nature of power and the nature of parliamentarianism, and they need to stop pushing towards a centralized state because, as you say, these these stupid ideas like you know man or the people is sovereign or whatever. All this does is is pull you towards centralized populist napoleonic di dictatorships you know it, that's that's really that's all it's ever going to do i think we can probably round out there then um we're pretty much towards the end of the stream when that slight hiccup happened anyway so it's not yeah. afraid there's too much i will ask are you able to end the stream on your end uh, from yes youtube because I, I can't <laughs> no windows I'm able like, to still end crashed right cool no 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 um i'm able to end the stream from here but um, thank you for coming. Uh, Panama Hat's channel is linked to the description. Is there anything you want to shill before we go? Um, no. Uh, as as they said, my channel's in in the description. Um, you can tip me on Kofi. Uh, the links are all there in my videos and stuff. Um, very much appreciated. Uh, no, that's it. Um, I have some books coming out later this year, um, and I'll. Give more info when they're, they're uh, about to happen. Oh, I was gonna say, do you not also have possibly in the works some kind of semi regular publication that you may be working on? Uh, I <clears throat> that's still very much in the planning stages. Uh, um, so I don't want to say too much about that, but yes, we're we're trying to pull together a kind of right wing uh journal, uh, you know, with sort of um uh et essays and poems and fictions and things. Um, all in it, and, and that's that sort of stuff. Just a, an actual kind of paper record of this community, if you will. Mm. Um, because um, I think I've that... put... oh, Sorry. Go on. I'm going to say, I put it in the chat, we've also got the Substack talking about uh, paper records, or at least digital paper records of things. Mm. That is where you can find mine and Evelyn's writing. I know you've been putting stuff up there more regularly. Um, you have a Substack as well, don't you, Panama Hat? Uh, I do, and there will be content on it soon. There's only one essay up at the moment, but there'll be more. Okay. Just double checking, we've shilled everything we need to shill. Um, apart from that, uh, we'll we'll keep doing these regular Monday and Thursday streams when we can. They may not be a Thursday stream this week because I'll probably be in transit. Um, but we'll see if I can maybe get a video together. Um, over the next couple of weeks, I'll be uh, recording with a couple of people. I think probably on the twenty. Third onwards, I might have some actual midweek videos to put out because I'll be recording with somebody, hopefully not getting the channel banned uh, from the 3D printed firearms community. Uh, so that should be uh, an interesting and hopefully not too fed posty one. And I may or may not have um, another guest, uh, but that that's yet to be seen because um, uh, uh, I've had a... Sorry, when you go. Sorry. 
I was going to say, uh, thank you guys for uh, for listening. Oh, hold and on, if you goodbye. I don't know if we're going to close off. Oh, no. What's happened? What? Oh, have you finished? Yes, I, I've not ended the stream yet, no. Oh, All <laughs> right. <laughs> I was waiting for you guys to say goodbye. Oh, no, I, I was just going to quickly say uh, there might All be right. a stream on Monday. Uh, I've got some essays opened in tabs somewhere that I may look at for doing one of those. Uh, I think we've got a decent stream planned for next Thursday. And then the Monday after, which would be a slightly later stream, however, will be with Radlib, which I think should be rather good as well. Hopefully something a bit like this, where we sort of sit down and actually hash out some form of central idea or issue mm-hmm. for a couple of hours. Yes, I, I did see a couple of Super Chats come in in the last couple of minutes, but I'll answer those next time. Um. Anyway, uh, that's. I'll say goodbye from me. You guys want to say goodbye? Goodbye, goodbye. everybody. Thanks for listening. There we go.